Yeah, it makes sense. I've actually been told to kind of stop doing so many things because I have a book that they're a book going through the process and my agent's like, well, if everyone knows your story, then why would they read the book? <laughs> I was actually, that was going to be one of my questions is when are you going to, when are you going to make a book? I mean, I just mean... listening to your story. Like I listened to a couple of your, um, I listened to a couple of your, like almost like Ted, not Ted talks, but when you were talking like uh, lectures, that's where I'm looking for and, and read the biographies and stuff. I'm like, why, why don't you have a book? <laughs> it's unbelievable. Cause I'm busy. <laughs> Honestly, I'm busy doing it. And then I'm still in the moment doing it. Um, and I, I have not gone to the ghostwriter. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. All ears with Chris Schnabel. I'm Chris Schnabel. This is episode 37, getting closer to that big 4 0. Now, the first thing you might be wondering is all ears. What the hell is he talking about? Well, I've been going through a little bit of a rebrand lately, um, switching everything from individual stuff to more towards my production studio, which is uh, Schnabel Studios, which is the page you probably found this on on YouTube or it's going to be in the description of this video as well. So you can find it there. And while I was doing this rebrand, I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Um, I love offstage, uh, you know, offstage is it's my baby. I, I had the documentary series and the festivals with it. It's been the staple of my independent filmmaking career. It's been, that's been, it was offstage. And from the beginning, I never really wanted to combine the interview show with the with offstage the documentary series. I just didn't think it fit as well. And and I thought during this rebranding, this was the perfect opportunity to kind of wipe the slate clean and and rebrand the show as well. So offstage radio, you'll probably still hear it in old episodes. You'll probably hear, oh, this is off stage radio or, or off stage or whatever. But we are now changing the name of the show because, you know, this show, it's its own thing. You know, it's its own message. It's its own. Um, it's its own entity. It does its own thing separate from the documentary series, which did its own thing as well. So this is this is all ears with Chris Schnabel. It's all ears because we come here, we listen to stories, we hear journeys, we have we have conversations with people that have interesting things and can we can really learn from. So I think all ears with Chris Schnabel is the way we're going to go. I don't think it. That's the way we're going to go. So if you're wondering, like, what is he talking about? Or if you saw the description, you're like, all ears. That's I thought it was off stage. Uh, off stage has officially been put to rest and um, will go down as one of the my favorite things I've ever done in my career. Um, it'll be, you know, how I started, but now it's, it's time. It's time. This became its own thing. So that long rant is just to tell you that this is now all ears and because we're all ears. Um, so if you're confused, that's why anyway, this is all ears episode 37 today. We have a really special guest. Um, all guests are very special guests, but this one's especially special. She was the first ever um, woman coach hired by an organization in 2015. She was hired by the Oakland athletics. Uh, she started baseball for all, which helps women get into baseball, whether it's playing coaching or just getting involved in any way, shape or form. Um, I, I can go down the list of accolades, but there's so many to name and I'd rather her just tell her story herself. So Justine Siegel, welcome to the show. How's it going? How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. It's busy getting ready for the baseball season. I know, you know, it's, I, it, I knew this was coming with the lockout and everything. And it's just for major league baseball. It's just, you, I sit here and this is usually a time where, you know, the Super Bowl just ended and you're like, all right, it's time. It's baseball time. And then here we are and, you know, dealing with the lockout. So it's that part's unfortunate, but uh, hopefully, you know, there's other routes of baseball to watch, but it's just unfortunate to see what's going on with baseball and still in a lockout. They've already postponed some of the spring training games. And I'm sure you're, you already know all about all this stuff. Cause it was something that we saw coming 
in the future. We just hope we never got to that point. We just hope that they would figure it out. But here we are. But um, speaking of baseball, you are like in baseball, you are you're part of history. You're part of baseball history. So I just want to know more about, you know, how you got to to where you are and how you got to get to the majors and stuff like that. I know from an early age, you wanted to coach baseball. Like you knew you wanted to coach baseball. Can you tell us a little bit more about like when you, when you figured out, like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So, um, at the moment I'm not coaching. Um, I'm the first woman to coach, uh, for a major league baseball organization that happened in 2015 when I went to instructs with the A's. And it took me really a whole lifetime to get there. Um, As you're referring to, I played baseball growing up, started with T-ball. And um, I just, I just enjoyed it. I mean, I've played like every sport. You name a sport, I'm pretty sure I've been on a team for it. Um, But baseball was something I just decided to stick with it. And then when I was told to quit when I was 13 or so, I just decided I would like play forever. Um, I don't know. The more people tried to take the game away from me, the more I was holding on. And so um, when I realized I wasn't going to play for Cleveland, which was my lifetime dream, I decided I'd be a coach. And um, the first time I told someone, I told my coach I wanted to be a coach and he laughed at me. So it was a really difficult goal to have. But like, I just kind of went for it and I just started at 16, learning everything I could about baseball to the best that I could. I didn't grow up in a baseball family or anything like that. And they didn't have the internet like they have today. <laughs> so you really just, I would go to a camp and I'd, I'd play outfield, even though I'm a pitcher or a third baseman, I would just play outfield so I could learn a little bit about outfield, stuff like that. And you, I mean, in, uh, in your biography, it says that you've, knew early on that you wanted to coach, but you know, when people told you you couldn't do it, that's when you're like, okay, I'm going to coach. Was that already a goal? You said you wanted to play for the, for Cleveland, but was that a goal already? Like you wanted to coach or was it being told you can't do it? The exact motivation that was like, now I'm going to do this to prove you wrong. I mean, I think my reaction was just like, um, you know, what men have is that, you know, when, when the time comes to stop playing, you want to stay in the game and you want to become a coach. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, I think that I probably could have been a soccer coach instead. You know, I played soccer in college. That would have been an easier road to go, but um, I just love baseball. And I mean, I can't tell you the hours I put in just throwing against the wall, me and myself, just trying to get a little better uh, and the time in the cages and just everything I could do to get better. And, and, you know, I played in men's leagues and so on. Um, but I knew at the college level, I wouldn't be able to play D1 or D2. Yeah, I mean, baseball is my favorite sport. I played it my entire life. And one thing I've always loved about baseball is like, you can do it yourself. Like you can, like you said, you threw against the wall or you can go off the tee or, you know, you don't always need like for football, if you want to pass to somebody, you kind of need someone to pass to, or you're just going to be chasing a ball around the whole time. Uh, I guess basketball, you have a little bit of the same thing, but it's just so like almost like relaxing for me to go hit off a tee and kind of just like let it all, you can let, let all the thoughts out for a little bit. You can kind of just turn your brain off and just hit a ball. So I can understand that. Like you just, it's almost like therap- uh, therapeutic, almost just go out and hit off a tee into the fence, put it back on and just do that for hours. I used to get lost for hours hitting a ball off a tee, just not even know what time it was just because it was so therapeutic for me. And it was so nice. It sounds like you kind of had the same thing. You just go out and hit a little bit, throw a little bit. You love the game. And I love when people love the game. I can talk baseball all day. So I absolutely love hearing that. Um, Speaking of women in baseball, there's been a lot of coaching hires of women in baseball. How has that been to see all these like the Red Sox and the Yankees hiring coaches, a head coach even for these major league teams? Yeah, I mean, it's great. Um, You know, it's one of those things where, you know, I was born in the wrong generation. But that's exactly how history works, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Your your grandmother probably wasn't allowed to play sports at all or field hockey. Um, And then Title IX came and then, you know, people fought for us to be able to play sports just like the boys. And so for me, I always knew that as the first woman, I was paving the way for the women behind me. So as much as I wanted to just be a coach, 
I didn't have the luxury of just being a coach. I had to, I had to be that role model. I had to not give up. I had to keep trying and, you know, just put a crack in the wall. And, and now in 2022, the wall's gone. And um, Alyssa Nakin is, is in the major leagues with the Giants. And we all know about Rachel Balkovic with the Yankees and the minor league team managing. Um, and Bianca Smith, who I think is a genius uh, with the Red Sox and, and so on and so on. So it's, it's fantastic that that opportunity is now there and, and girls can go tell someone they want to be a coach and, and not get laughed at and know to real pathway. Yeah, I was going to say you you said that you were born in the wrong era, but I mean, you were born in the perfect time because if it wasn't for you, who knows where we'd even be right now with that kind of stuff. We might still be 10 years behind, 20 years behind something like that. You know, we'd still be building to the point we're at now. So, you know, someone has to be a pioneer and and that was where you were. You were a pioneer for these women that are now coaching for these major league teams. So I think you were born right in the perfect era to be that pioneer, to help these women get to that Thank point. You, Chris. That's kind of you. Of course. I mean, that's, that's just, that's just what I feel with that. So um, you started baseball for all, which is a nonprofit to help give girls opportunities to play coach or get involved in baseball. I mean, this is one of the many things you've done for women um, in baseball. Can you tell us a little bit more about baseball for all? Yeah, I started baseball for all or what is it became baseball for all. Um, 24 years ago, 23 years ago. Um, I just got tired of waiting for opportunities. I wanted my own daughter who I had in college. And we have a lot of college listeners. I had her in college. Um, I just wanted her to grow up not having to face the same discrimination that I faced and, and just play baseball. So I started thinking about like, how can I help the future, right? Instead of just waiting, what can I do proactively? And so um, it is now what is Baseball for All, a national nonprofit, uh, helping community start girls baseball programs. And since, and, and we run events for those girls teams to come together. So we have, our biggest event is nationals, which is this year we'll have some, over 700 girls playing baseball out in Colorado. Um, and there are all teams that have been built around this idea that I guess nationals is like the prime event, right? That's, that's the catalyst to start the teams. But now, now it's like these girls teams are here every year and they're playing not just at our event, but also in our smaller events or a regional event, that type of thing. Um, so you, it's very exciting to see the growth. Do you go around to different cities and stuff like that with baseball for all to try to start teams and maybe some cities that don't have it or towns that don't have it, or do they kind of just build and then you just create the national circuit basically or national tournament? I should yeah, say. Yeah. Yeah. So we do the hard work, which is help community start the teams. So usually if through our website, someone comes to us and says, my daughter wants to play, where can she play? And then I'll say, Hey, why don't you start a team? And then we'll walk them through that process. Um, because we are only as strong as our volunteers. It has to be a volunteer on the ground that is willing to do the work. And then we, we help them through that and connect them to our community. So if you are, for example, we ran a, we use our tournament as motivation to start teams, meaning it's a goal that parents can understand. Like if we start a team, then we go play here. So last year we held our nationals in um, Aberdeen at the Ripken Experience. And we use that as a way to grow more teams on the East Coast. And so now the Philadelphia, New Jersey area is like three, four, five teams, you know, just because we, we took that area. And then, of course, Georgia grew. I think Georgia now is three or four teams. So um, that event allows people to see what's possible because most of our girls play with the boys. But then when they play with the other girls, they see how magical and empowering it is and and our girls are staying in the game longer because they know other girls who are still playing. So um, it's, it's a slow process, but at the same time, we're moving faster than, than, you know, I can keep up with, so to speak. And so we're very, very busy. And it, it helps if that's their first experience playing in that tournament at the Ripken. That is a beautiful <laughs> facility. It is <laughs> such a beautiful facility. And it's right there. And uh, was at Myrtle beach, right? Like right um, there there Myrtle, Beach. Myrtle Beach, and then we did ours in Maryland, which was really a great location for our East yeah. Coast. Yeah, it's a great facility. It's a great spot to play. So if that's like your first experience, like playing with a bunch of other girls and women, like it's just 
you now see like, oh, this is actually something I can really start getting into. Plus you're playing in like a, such a great facility. It's like this, this is actually something I can do. This is actually for me. It's not like when you see people start up a league, not necessarily women, but any league and it's they, any field they can find. And you might have a bad experience there because the field's not great or whatever around it. But when you put it into something where you can tell people took the time it, to actually build something like this is what you deserve. This is what you should be getting. It really helps with that. Like, Oh, I need to continue this because this is something I really love kind of drives the love out of you almost sometimes when you're like, this is actually yeah. something that's amazing. Going to, to a really good facility does add to the magic, you know, mm-hmm. it makes them feel important. Like, you know, just ball players. And that's, that's what's great about our tournament is that they're not the girl on the team. They're just ball players playing in a, a magical place and, and just playing like that's literally all girls want to do is just play baseball. But so often being the only girl in the league and the only girl on their team, they're told that they should quit or they have an expiration date, right? You can't play high school. You can't go to college. And so we're, we're helping um, take some of those blockades away. So I want to talk a little bit about you coaching baseball, especially in the majors and stuff like that. So you got a gig in 2009 in the Canadian American League. Um, how did you end up getting that gig? Was it something you applied for? Did you talk to somebody for it or did somebody come out and reach out to you? Yeah, well, I was the only woman co- coaching college baseball. I was an assistant at Springfield College pursuing my PhD in sports psychology at the time. So I, um, I met Mike Vec who um, owns different minor league teams, part of ownership group, his father, um, Bill Vack used to be at the White Sox. Um, and so he helped me interview for some teams and uh, the Brockton Rocks took me after three interviews. And that meant that I would be the first woman to coach men's pro baseball in the US. So, um, and it was independent and that was, it's like amazing to have your dream come true. You know, like your first game you're standing on the, for the, on the line for the national anthem. And you're like, I'm here. Like everyone who told me I should quit, like I'm here. Um, and so I, I did that. Um, and then, then from there I went back and I coached, I did uh, another year of college baseball as a, helping a video. Um, and then from there I decided I wanted to throw batting practice. <laughs> That's been a dream of mine since I was 17. Um, I, it was one of those things where like I saw when I was a kid, I used to go to pregame all the time. And I saw this like old man go and throw bat, batting practice. I know, I know now that that guy was not an old man and he's like 40, <laughs> but when you're in high school, it seems old and he's throwing slow and I'm like, I can do that. So I was 37 and I'm like, I should do that. And so I started asking around and, um, seeing what's possible. And it it was a long, not a long process, but I had to keep finding a new way to ask because everyone thought like I was softball. Mm -hmm. But um, in the end, Joe Madden said maybe when he was with the Rays. And so my friend introduced me to Billy Bean and said that I was going to pitch to the Rays. So could I pitch to the A's? And he said, yes, in five seconds. And um, from there, I actually went back to Cleveland and said, can I, uh, can I make history with you? Because no woman had done this before. And, and so they said, yes. And uh, like, you know, I mean, I didn't get to play for Cleveland, but I do have their Jersey. You know, mm-hmm. I did get to, to, to wear the uniform for a day. And um, so that, that was fantastic. And um, I went to both the grapefruit league and in, in Arizona because I threw to six different teams. Um, and then from there, I got invited to go to scout school. That's the first thing I didn't have to fight for. You know, I just, someone knew me, someone knew my name and they're like, you should go to scout school. And uh, so the Indians sponsored me, I'm sorry, Cleveland sponsored me. And then from there I was like, oh, okay. How can I become a coach now? <laughs> I've done this. How do I become a coach? And so I asked Billy Bean for four years, if I could come coach. And finally in the fourth year, he said, yes. And that so- was for in- instructs instructional league. And that was, that was it. It's like, such a short period of time that I coached, but like it took a whole life and my qualifications were just, I mean, I have a PhD, I'm a scout, you know, I'm an associate scout with uh, major league baseball bureau. Um, 
I've actually I coached three years at the college level. So so I had this resume, but um, I needed the, all of that resume to get there, if that makes sense, to, yeah, to break and, that barrier. And a couple and, of years on top of that, because you said you already had that relationship with the A's, who is the team that you eventually had that that stint with. So it took the whole resume and a couple of years after that to to really finally yeah. get that opportunity. I mean, I kept asking him over and over because of that relationship. I asked some other teams um, and then I got it um, and it was just for instruct. So then I had to start asking more teams, like, can I get another job, trying to get another job, this and that. Um, and I eventually um, was with Team Israel with the World Baseball Classic Qualifier um, in Brooklyn, which was fantastic. And then of course they went on to Korea and did really well mm -hmm. um, beyond all ex expectations. So. It's been a little bit of this and a little bit that I'd love to say that, Hey, I was hired by the Red Sox and boom, you'll see me at spring training, but that just wasn't my path. I had to kind of like, um, just create the path and it was sort of like, you know, boulders in it, but yeah. you know, uh, Gabe from the, from the giants, I must've asked him if I could coach like twice. And then he went and hired someone, you know, he, the right person at the right time for him. And, I think it's just that it's like people just have to get their mind opened and opened and open. And then when the right time comes that that opportunity opens up and now we have women, there's so many women coaching. I can't keep count. I think yeah. it's 12, 11 or 12. Yeah, like I said, trailblazer. I mean, if it wasn't for all the work that you put in, where would it be for the 12 women that are working now? So, I mean, doing a lot for baseball, doing a lot for baseball. So I want to speak about it mentally. So, I mean, just going up, growing up in baseball and coaching in baseball, and you had to really keep strong mentally. You couldn't break or people would just be like, see, this is why you can't do it. Like you couldn't have a breakdown. They'd be like, see, this is why you can't do it. You almost had to do extra because you see, you see men in baseball break down all the time. It happens. It happens all the time in the dugout. You see somebody be up a water cooler, you see whatever it might be. But if you were to do it, because of gender, they would say, this is why you can't do it. So how did you mentally keep yourself together? What did you do? So you didn't have breakdowns. So you didn't just freak out or anything like that. Who said I didn't have mental breakdowns? <laughs> um, it was, it was really hard being the first everywhere I went and play and to have people say things about you while you're trying to play and have adults who are supposed to be coaches or parents, just like allow people to say these things while you're trying to just play a game. Um, so, I mean, I knew I wasn't going to quit. So from a, from a fortitude standpoint, I just knew I would never let someone just like bully me off and quit. So that wasn't even an option, but there were times when I didn't handle the pressure um, of, of, to me, it felt like if I struck out, that meant people could say girls can't play baseball. And that's how I felt. So, I felt a responsibility when I was playing it. So I didn't get to have as much fun as I think maybe you did. You know, it's like my favorite times were probably in the batting cage or baseball camp, you know, where the pressure was off and all I'm doing is playing with the other guys. But in a game, it was just even my school who wouldn't let me try out. And then, you know, three years later, I came back. I had actually pitched against them at a camp and they saw me pitch and then they let me try out. So it was just this endless struggle of trying to prove that I belonged and I could have handled it better and I could have handled it worse. And today these girls don't have to go through that as much anymore because they know they're not the only girl playing. And that's what I wanted to do with baseball for all of us to make girls feel to know they're not alone and that they have a community behind them. What do you think? Um, I watched the uh, Girls of Summer documentary. One thing I, I took really took from it was the how normalized it still is today that girls play softball, guys play baseball. And it's something that, you know, as we progress as as humans, like we are evening out in some areas. But for some reason, it's still girls play softball, guys play baseball. What do you think we have to do to kind of change that narrative? Do we just keep pushing forward with girls playing baseball? Is there something that we, we need other people to step up in? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I do think that there's change. Um, since we started the national first National Girls Baseball Tournament in 2015, MLB has come out saying they support girls baseball. 
uh, which is a big voice to um, the leagues like Pony and Little League and AAU that, you know, girls play baseball. So how can you make how can you make that experience better or more inviting? Um, so I think that there is a difference. There is a change just in, in four years, five years. Um, but we're not there yet, as you've noted, Chris, but we are getting there. More, more people are hearing about girls playing baseball, even at the college level. I have more coaches who are open to um, seeing uh, female recruits who might make a good fit for their team. And can you talk a little bit more about the Girls of Summer documentary? Um, I know you had a big part because one of the teams that you created was kind of a part of that. Could you tell us a little bit about that? The team that you created, the all-women's team, you talked a little bit about it, but I think you started in the early 2000s. Um, I took it the first girls team to a national boys tournament, which is Cooperstown, James Park. Okay. And so we did that for, I did that like for 13 years. It was me or another coach, but it was through our program. And you know, I'm really, really, I just thought, where, what can I do? What can I do? I'm like, I mean, I mean, I remember the day and it was just like, let's get girls together who love baseball and where would be the best place in the world to play Cooperstown and boom, dreams park, you know, we didn't have to do the waiting list. They're just like, we're going to put you in. And now we played and and like our first year, as you painfully watched, we lost all our games. Um, but when we finished in that 13th year, uh, we finished 21st out of 104 teams without any practices or one practice the day before. Um, in fact, if I went today, I'm pretty sure I could break into the top 15 with the girls I have now. But my goal is no longer to play with girls. Um, my goal is not to create all-star teams. My goal is that every girl could get a chance to go play if that's what she wants to do. So, But at the time, that was the only thing that we could do. I had to start somewhere, and that was with the one team, the Sparks. And uh, now, now we're going to a tournament with seven hundred girls. It's every story. It's felt like it, if you can have the talent or more talent, but until you actually prove it to somebody, nobody will even take it serious. Which again is probably part of the narrative of all of this. Is like you shouldn't have to have the proof when a guy that some kid that's playing on the other team could be the coach's son for all we know. And they, they get every opportunity they want. But like you said, you had to play outfield, even though you can pitch, they wouldn't let you on the team until they saw you actually pitch against them. Your team had to compete or like you had to have kind of an all-star team or they wouldn't, you know, they don't take it serious. And I think that's just part of the whole narrative. Um, I had the same conversation with Dan Hughes who coached in the WNBA of the same kind of thing. It's like, when he, he started, he was around when the start of the WNBA was, and it was like, if you weren't proving it, it's like nobody even takes it serious. And you saw how long for the WNBA it even took to actually be taken as a league that people put time and investment into. And it's just, I I'm somebody that if you are the best at something, you deserve that spot. I don't care gender. I don't care race. Like that is how everything should be looked at. I know that's like, that's like everybody's like, yeah. And our, but a lot of people are like, no, like this is what we want. And I don't, I don't believe in that at all. If you are the best, you are the best. doesn't matter what you are. If you committed your life to it and you are better than this person, that's, that's your spot. So hearing stories like this, it just kind of frustrates me. Just like you, if, if you are better than that person, then you are better than that person. But again, that's what happens when you're a pioneer in this stuff their team, that team was a pioneer to the tournament that you just talked about with 700 teams, 700 girls that if it wasn't for those teams, we wouldn't have that. So I, it's, I guess it's just hearing the pioneer story. It's like, but why aren't they being smart? Like if this team's better, this team's better. But then you think about, well, because somebody had to do it. Somebody had to build to that point. And I guess I'm just glad that you did because I, I enjoyed seeing like the progression. I enjoy seeing the equality coming in. I actually coached high school baseball in Boston and the team, we versed a team that had girls and guys on the team. It wasn't just an all guys team. And just seeing that, like when I was in high school, you didn't see that. And a couple was not even, not even 10 years later, you know, you're seeing this in, in Boston. So it's, it was great yeah. to see. But there's also schools in Boston that don't allow girls to play. Yeah. So like it's against their law. Like they have a rule 
that says girls can't play. And it's not just Boston, it's, it's across the country. So that's a discrimination that we're still having to face, but it is better. It's definitely better. Like you said, um, you saw the girls playing and, and the boys tend to just kind of get over it. You know, it's like, it's a novelty and then it's not a novelty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, same like when I coach, it's like, Oh wait, who's that? <laughs> and then the next year it's like, there's a freshman when I was coaching college and she's like, Oh, who's that girl? And you know, the player, the returning player is just like, Oh, that's our coach. That's coach Justine. Um, and so that's, and that's it. That's the story. <laughs> Um, this year, uh, we're, we're launching something that, um, your students could actually get involved in is that we're hosting the first women's college club baseball championship. And so our goal is NCAA status. And we are starting, um, we are teaching students how to start a team on their campus, and then they get to come to our championship. Um, and this year it's, we purposely are very small with four teams. But then, you know, next year we're going to need, we're going to be building teams. So if, if anybody listening wants to start or Chris, if you want to start a women's club baseball team, then I would see it at our, our college championships next year. So this is college level, college championships. Yeah. So everything campus. we've talked about has been girls um, pretty much 18 and under. And so this is our new college initiative. Uh, so many girls are told they should quit baseball because they should go pursue a softball scholarship. And um, that's problematic in many ways, but for one, um, you know, we can erase that barrier of where someday they'll be able to get a scholarship at the NCAA level um, by creating that pipeline. So um, we have a team, for example, at uh, UW University of Washington, who has, who's just started a club team and, and they'll be here in LA next, next month, like four weeks from now uh, to play in our first event. So none of those teams existed before, but it's possible. You just have to have a drive. You, you want to do something. You want to play the game. You have drive. You can go find other students who want the same thing. So if somebody's interested, that's listening to this and they want to learn more information, where can they go to, to figure out more information? Yeah, they can email me at girls, baseball at baseball for all.com. Um, awesome. And our Instagram is amazing. So if anyone's on Insta, which is most people go to our baseball for all, uh, because we just got great photography and stories. If you like these pioneering stories, you know, go hear from an 11 year old who's just working her butt off to make the team and hitting and hitting dingers, really. Um, some of our girls are so good. Um, but at the same time, we want our girls not to have to be so good. You know, you shouldn't have to be an all star to play this game when the boys have so many opportunities to just be and play and hang with their friends. We want that same opportunity. Yeah. Give, give a chance to actually see if you like the game before you have to be an all-star at it to even get the chance, you know, it's how you're going to know if you like it, if you have to be the best at it, just to even get an opportunity to see if you like it. It's, it's yeah, not a good I mean, narrative. Just go look at the major leagues and how many GMs haven't played more than JV high school. Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine. JV high school is fine. I played JV high school, but now they're GMs of major league clubs. And if you, you deny that opportunity, you know, that's just one more door that probably won't open up to them. You know, you don't have to be an all-star to, to be in this game. In my opinion, you don't have, you shouldn't have to be an all-star. You should have to be able to love the game, be able to study the game, be able to add to the game, help your team in all of those ways. And uh, before we wrap it up, I just want to ask, can, what advice can you give to somebody that's trying to kind of do the same thing you're trying to, maybe not the same exact thing, but they're trying to break through a barrier that they just can't break through? What advice can you give them to keep going strong? Ask for help. That's something I didn't do when I was young, but it is something I started doing when I threw batting practice. Ask for help. There are other people who have the expertise. Can they give you an introduction? Um, can they tell you that, hey, why don't you go get this part of your education. You know, for me, I got a PhD because I wanted to use my education to break the barrier. Um, I knew that I wanted to use education as a tool that other men who coach didn't have because they didn't need it. So, you know, I wanted to be above and beyond. Um, and my advice would be, honestly, there's no wall. You just kind of maybe have to go around it, under it, break it, over it. You know, the wall is just a mirage. 
and and there's and there's way to get ways to get through thank you so much is there um are there any links or anything like that that you want us to to push out for people other than the the college championships yeah i think anyone who's interested you can go to our website baseballforall.com and you'll get linked there if you email us it'll come to me um but i'd love to see a college college team come up in the next year and see you at our championships awesome thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me of course so you can catch um all of her stuff at baseballforall.com that's where you can see more about baseball for all you can also see all these tournaments and things she's talking about um you can also watch the documentary girls of summer talks about her team and obviously the 13 year stretch they had in cooperstown you can follow us um, on Instagram at schnabel.studios. That's S-C-H-N-A-B-E-L dot studios. Or you can get us on Twitter at Schnabel Studios. Same spelling, no dot. Same spelling, no dot on Twitter. Um, you can go to YouTube and you can catch this. You can catch Sketching Up. You can catch a bunch of videos. That's all on Schnabel Studios YouTube. Um, if you have, if you want to go on YouTube and watch some of these, you can watch them on there as well. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening in. We were all ears with Justin Siegel today. Catch you next time. See you later. No longer off stage. This is all ears with Krishna. See you later.